Sustainability Defined would like to thank Bullet Frontier Whiskey for sponsoring this episode. To learn more about Bullet, go to bullet.com. That's B-U-L-L-E-I-T dot com. All right, welcome listeners back to Sustainability Defined. Jay and I still here defining sustainability one concept and one bad joke at a time. Today is episode 56, Sustainability and Spirits with Sophie Kelly from Bullet Frontier Whiskey and Eric Sprague from American Forest. So Jay, I think this is apt a year like 2020. You know, we want to have responsible consumption, but totally fair. I think if people want to have a bit, a little bit of spirits here at the end of the year. Right. Yeah. We're going to cheers to this one, Scott. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. So here's what today's introduction is going to look like. We're going to ask a number of questions. Number one, what do we mean by sustainability in the spirits category? Number two, what is the environmental, economic, and social impact of spirits production? Number three, why are spirits brands focused on the issue of sustainability? Four, how are spirits companies trying to reduce their environmental impact and help communities? Mm -hmm. Five, how can listeners purchase spirits from brands that are taking action to be more sustainable and encourage more sustainable spirits production? And then finally, we will introduce Bullet Whiskey and its sustainability efforts. And of course, our expert guests, Sophie Kelly, SVP of Whiskies at Diageo North America, and Eric Sprague, VP of Forest Restoration at American Forests. So Scott, let's get moving. Packed agenda here, Jay, but let's start like we always do, the basics. What do we mean by sustainable spirits? Well, Jay, we looked for some good existing definitions of this topic like we always do, and unbelievably, we didn't see any definition or standard for sustainable spirits. Uh, But first, it is important to define spirits, and by that we mean distilled liquor, with high alcohol by volume, such as gin, rum, tequila, vodka, and whiskey. The International Wine and Spirit Competition recently set a standard on what a brand must meet to be considered sustainable in its competition. This encompasses repurposing efforts, think recycling casks, sourcing alternative energy, reducing plastics, etc., energy-efficient production, eliminating single-use plastics, supporting the local economy, and conscious ingredient sourcing and use. Right. So we have this standard from this competition, but also the Distilled Spirits Council of the United States lists several environmental sustainability best practices on its website, including land stewardship, responsible water use, and energy reduction. So we're going to dive deeper into these tactics and more later in the episode. But in short, sustainable spirits involves not only looking at the production of various spirits, It also includes the environmental impact of operations, sourcing ingredients, things like that. It also entails what kind of packaging is used, how the company treats its employees, and how it engages with communities and social issues. So with that, Jay, let's dive in here. What is the environmental, economic, and social impact of spirits production? Right. So, Scott, as you know, with any environmental impact discussion these days, we have to talk carbon footprint. I do know that. (laughs) Surprise to, to no one out there listening. According to a 2012 study by the Beverage Industry Environmental Roundtable, B-I-E-R, beer, possibly the greatest acronym ever created, Mm -hmm. titled Research on the Carbon Footprint of Spirits, a single 750 milliliter bottle of spirits produces more than six pounds of CO2, which is the equivalent of driving seven miles in an average passenger vehicle. This was a cradle-to-grave life cycle analysis that included beverage ingredients, think barley, corn, rye, and water, packaging materials, production and warehouse, retail and consumption, transportation and distribution, and end-of-life slash recycling. So the entire picture there. Yeah, pretty comprehensive LCA done here. And the largest sources of emissions, according to this life cycle analysis, were the distillation process, the packaging, think like glass bottle, and warehousing. So let's focus on this distillation process because it accounted for the most at about a third of all emissions. It's an energy intensive process and it can create waste in the form of spent mash, wastewater, and spirit specific byproducts like tequila's acidic pulp and rum's fibrous leftovers known as mostos. Love that word, mostos. Fibrous leftovers. (laughs) I can't figure out if that sounds like there's potential in it or if it's just kind of like a little bit gross. Mm -hmm. So... 
Outside of carbon, another area of environmental impact is water use. So BEER, back to Mm B-I-E-R, their 2018 Water Energy and Emissions Efficiency Trends and Observations Report. That's a title. Yes, say that five times fast. Looked at carbonated soft drinks, bottled water, breweries, distilleries, and wineries. It concluded, quote, distilleries tend to be the most water intensive facility type within the industry due to the distilling and cooling processes, as demonstrated by their higher water use ratios compared to other facility types. Cooling water remains the largest component of a distillery's water use profile, historically driving the larger water use ratios reported for this facility type. Right, but overall, this same report found that between 2013 and 2017, water use, energy use, and emissions ratios, that's the CO2 equivalent per liter, at the distilleries they tracked decreased 24%, 17%, and 9% respectively. So while there's certainly an impact to spirit production, there has been improvement in the environmental impact of spirits over time. Good news. Another cheers to that. Yeah. Moving to economic impact. The total economic impact of America's beer, wine, and spirits retail industry is $363.33 billion annually. And the industry is responsible for 1.65% of the U.S. economy based on total GDP. It's no joke. It is seriously no joke. We are focusing on spirits specifically in this episode more than beer and wine, but really, Scott, the point here is that this is a major, major industry. Totally, and that also means it has a social impact. So when we're talking socially, there's a lot to consider, from how the workers that grow the ingredients and produce the product are treated to the very real issue of responsible consumption. On the social front in this episode, we're going to focus mainly on ethical supply chains. Okay, Jay, let's move to our next section here. Why are spirits brands focused on sustainability? Well, consumers want to buy spirits from brands with a smaller footprint. Last year, IWSR, a leading source of data and intelligence on the alcoholic beverage market, noted in its Global Trends report that consumers are looking for ways to decrease their environmental impact on a micro level, and they expect beverage companies to hold similar standards throughout the production chain. So they want to you know, in their individual decisions, make an impact. Right. And it's not just the consumers, but it's the folks that are serving them also. Mm-hmm. So bartenders want to serve more sustainable drinks as well. In general, bartenders are more mindful of the ingredients they're using. In Bacardi's global brand ambassador survey, 31% of bartenders noted an increasing interest in local fresh ingredients. At Kempton Hotels, they surveyed their bartenders and 88% said they consider sustainability when designing a new cocktail for the menu. All right, Scott, next up, how are spirit companies trying to reduce their environmental impact and help communities? All right, Jay, so everybody buckle up here uh, because unsurprisingly, we got a whole lot of examples to talk about when it comes to spirit companies reducing their environmental impact. And we're going to touch on sustainable sourcing, running on renewable energy, carbon emissions, minimizing operational waste and incorporating ingredients that would otherwise have gone to waste, water use, and packaging. Okay, so first, sustainable sourcing. This includes using local ingredients, growing ingredients with minimal environmental impact, and also incorporating ingredients that may otherwise go to waste. All right, so first let's touch on this example of sourcing locally. Charleston, South Carolina's Striped Pig Distillery sources corn and native heirloom grains from local farms, and sugarcane from nearby Savannah, Georgia. Its owner says this is a win-win, which of course, Scott is a sustainability-defined podcast favorite. We love it so much. Because it lowers costs and reduces its carbon footprint. Okay, so now let's talk about examples of incorporating ingredients that would normally go in the trash. San Diego's Misadventure Vodka makes vodka from day-old pastries from local bakeries. Misadventure was founded on the concept of hedonistic sustainability, the idea that doing good doesn't have to be a punishment. Jay, hedonistic sustainability. That's basically what we're doing on the podcast, is it not? Oh, what a brand new slogan for the podcast. (laughs) So much pleasure from this. Uh, (laughs) And the discarded brand incorporates ingredients destined for landfill as well. For example, last year it debuted a Caribbean rum infused with banana peel. So banana peels, not just made for tripping. Oh, God, Scott, that's so good. <laughs> I, I saw it in my mind. You had it there. It's just, I just love it when we're in sync. Mm-hmm. So, Not tripping over each other, yeah. Lister C does it again. My goodness. <laughs> All right, so we hit distillers that incorporate old pastries and banana peels. 
let's do one more dairy, which is something I don't think really many folks would consider. Mm -hmm. Dairy distillery takes the 150,000 liters of milk permeate that the dairy it partners with had been dumping every day and uses it to make lactose and sugar-free spirit. And Scott, speaking as a guy that uh, tries to avoid lactose, I am all in favor. Mm. As a startup on a smaller scale, a company like Dairy Distillery can make these sorts of moves. But still, when you think about it, it's it's sold quite a bit. The distillery's Vod Cow brand, which again is mm. ingenious, has sold over 25,000 bottles just in 10 months. Let's move to a, a different section here from waste to running on renewable energy. So solar and wind, of course, important, but they aren't the only kinds of clean energy. One unique distillery that stuck out to us is Reka Vodka, which is based in Iceland and runs entirely on carbon-free geothermal energy. But back to those more traditional sources of renewable energy, Square One Organic Spirits utilizes wind power for production at its Rigby, Idaho facility, and it says that it is the largest user of wind power in the entire state. Amazing. So on top of running on renewable energy, reducing energy use is, of course, important as well. Seattle-based Novo Fogos, Zero Waste Kachaka Production Facility in Paraná, Brazil, Ooh, nice. was built in an innovative way to reduce typical energy use. The facility was built on a slope of a hillside such that each room is set a little bit lower than the next, which allows gravity to move liquid from one room to the other for processing. Mm. Very clever move. Brilliant, brilliant. Okay, there's also a startup backed by Derek Jeter, I don't, not sure why that's totally important, but hey, Derek Jeter, called Bespoken <laughs> Spirits that allows spirits to be aged in days rather than months or years and customizes the liquor to meet customer specifications. So without relying on barrel storage to mature the liquor and instead using a three-step process over just three to five days, its co-founder says its process uses just 1% of the energy of normal production and aging. Pretty amazing. Sounds like a home run to me, Scott. Oh, my God. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so, of course, there is also the area of finding additional ways to reduce carbon emissions. Air.co claims to be the, quote, most sustainable vodka since it is made from air, water, and sun. And is carbon negative, meaning it actually reduces carbon as it is produced. How, you might ask? Well, it produces ethyl alcohol from carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. The startup says that each bottle produced is equal to the daily carbon intake of eight trees. Wow, that's quite a good uh, selling point there. So now let's talk about minimizing waste and finding use for byproducts. So one example is the spent grains from Bullet Distilling Company and Cascade Hollow Distilling Company, which distills George Dickel Tennessee Whiskey. Uh, those spent grains, they're converted to distillers' dried grains, or DDGs. The DDGs are typically sold as animal feed. Additionally, third-party logistics are minimized during this process because the trucks delivering grain to the site are able to collect the DDG and take them off-site. So that minimizes empty load miles because they drop off the grain and then put the DDG right in there. Another example of minimizing waste comes from good old Jack Daniels which took the extreme step five years ago of removing every single dumpster from its premises to force its employees to reconsider throwing away materials that could be recycled. Today, less than 1% of Jack Daniels' waste ends up in a landfill, which is incredibly impressive for any organization, really. So yeah, they really forced the issue there, huh, Jay, taking away those dumpsters. I'm Certainly. sure there was some employees that were like, WTF? <laughs> but it worked. <laughs> Here's one more cool example of finding alternative uses for byproducts. So more Spanish, Jay. Here we go. All right, listos. <laughs> yeah. Sombra Mezcal has worked with architects at the Consultorio de Asesoría Arquitectónica mm. to make adobe bricks using its agave waste that are then used for rebuilding earthquake damage in the Sierra Mixe district of Oaxaca in Mexico, which is really pretty awesome. Wow. Muy bueno, señor Seal. Well done. So... <laughs> Uh, we've talked about all these ways that the ingredients can be saved or reused, but another option is just to take these broad products and, and compost them where possible. So that, that's another e option. Exactly. Exactly. So, okay, again, under this subtopic, we have the efficient use of water. And one quick example here, 
Absolute Vodka, which has made water a priority for its operations. Absolute Vodka doesn't use artificial irrigation in its wheat production. It doesn't release wastewater and it collects rainwater to be used by the local farming community, which is which is an awesome way to touch different bases there. Nice. So we've done sustainable sourcing, renewable energy, carbon emissions, minimizing waste, efficient water use, and now let's move on to our last one, packaging. So this includes not just what kind of container you use, but what you do with it, uh, to basically to make sure that it can be recycled or reused. So one issue that's come up is frosted or screen printed bottles can muck up the recycling system. Charleston, South Carolina's Virgil Kane uses labels made with post-consumer waste, non-toxic glues, and eco-friendly inks to address this issue. And then you've got Mexico's Mezcales de la Inda. You're not the only one, Jay, that can do that. <laughs> uh, incorporates natural corks for easier recycling. Then another thing that some spirit brands are doing is incentivizing recycling with discounts. At Atlanta's ASW Distillery, customers are encouraged to return their used bottles for a 15% discount in the tasting room. Bottles are then recycled or repurposed depending on their condition. And Jay, I can tell you in my work with the Can Manufacturers Institute, we say that 40% of the cans that we recycle come from just the 10 U.S. deposit states. So that tells you the power of no that incentive. Yeah, wow. that, that tells you the power of that incentive. Just, you know, even some sense, you know, this 15% discount here. I'm sure they get a lot of bottles back. Awesome. Well, continuing this talk about packaging, there are other groups that are looking into packaging alternatives. Johnny Walker Whiskey is launching a paper-based bottle next year made from sustainably sourced wood pulp. These paper-based bottles will have a carbon footprint 90% less than glass bottles, Hmm. and they also won't have a plastic-based lining, which is hard to extract and recycle. Certainly, many spirits come in glass bottles, and distillers are trying to improve glass recycling as well as we're talking about packaging. Yeah. For example, Roberta Barbieri, while she was at Diageo, led the charge along with other glass industry experts for what became the Glass Recycling Coalition which has the entire glass recycling value chain collaborating to improve glass recycling, mainly via outreach and education. And Jay, you and I actually wrote a Green Biz article back in 2018 about how this glass recycling coalition was formed. We interviewed Roberta. So check it out. Yeah, we'll, we'll link to this article in the internodes. And another thing to note here is that today there's also the nonprofit Glass Recycling Foundation that includes Diageo, Ardaw Group, and Northeast Recycling Council as supporters. The foundation was formed to provide and raise funds for projects with the most significant impact for glass recycling. All right, listeners, we're going to take a quick time out. Let's catch our breaths. That was the environmental section under this category of how are spirit companies trying to reduce their environmental impact and help communities. So with that now down the hatch, Mm -hmm. let's move on to the social component. And we can start with this idea of taking care of employees. This includes things like a living wage, flexible hours, safe working conditions, and others. Mm -hmm. One example here that we like is Tanteo Tequila, which is based in Guanacatlan, Mexico, which offers English lessons after work and childcare on-site to its more than 85% women employees. Some brands have taken the step of being fair trade certified which entails complying with around 300 labor, social, and environmental standards. So fair trade certified is really more than making sure that those making the product are compensated fairly. I didn't really know it was more than that, to be honest. That's what I kind of thought. Fair trade, oh, they make sure that the people producing the the product are compensated fairly. But yeah, it's interesting. Right. And I see it. It kind of expands its, its scope there. One example here is Flora de Cana's rum, which is fair trade certified. On top of that, since 1913, it has covered its employees' education. Mm. Another example here of, of widening that scope. So under this social umbrella, we can talk taking care of employees. We can also talk using your brand as a platform to create social change. Illegal Mezcal protests anti-immigration policies and advocates for LGBTQ plus rights. And Gray Whale Gin in San Francisco is another example as it donates 1% of its sales to the nonprofit Oceana to help restore wild fish stocks, which in turn, you guessed it, dear listener, help the whales. Mm-hmm. It's good when there's some authenticity, you know, as, and just part of these 
sort of commitments or sure. giving a, a portion of proceeds. And the spirits industry in general has aligned with Black Lives Matter and announced several initiatives. One comes from the Kentucky Distillers Association. It released a statement on June 9th outlining plans to expand diversity and inclusion within the bourbon industry, starting by creating and funding distilling scholarships and internships for people of color, women, and other minority groups. And this is important since the craft alcohol business is predominantly a white one. And we link to an article that gets into that. Uh, Diageo has pledged $20 million to support businesses, consumers, and partners integral to the hospitality industry in black communities across the United States that have been impacted by the coronavirus. In addition to this, inclusion and diversity is a core business priority for Diageo North America. One of its brands, Johnny Walker, it actually established the Keep Walking Fund, which will directly support black women entrepreneurs and further economic advancement, partnering with Black Girl Ventures, and that's an organization, uh, through funding, mentorship, and additional resources. More generally, Diageo North America has been consistently recognized as one of the best places to work for LGBTQ employees by the Human Rights Campaign, and it received a 100% on the HRC's 2020 Corporate Equality Index, which we linked to. I didn't know about it until I saw this, so uh, that's something to check out for other companies that are scoring well on those sort of things. Exactly. And of course, Scott, there's certainly more these companies can do. And a new firm was actually started to help them do that. Earlier this year, the Black Bourbon Society launched a nonprofit consultancy firm called Diversity Distilled to create more diversity and inclusion across the spirits industry and really help push this forward. All right. So listeners, you just heard a whole lot of examples of spirit brands taking action in the environmental and social categories to reduce their impact and also just advance the communities that they touch. Uh, But all of these above actions to improve environmental and social performance, they take time and resources. They take people to execute them. And spirits companies, they're investing in larger sustainability teams to help with sourcing, reducing energy use, and the other tactics we described above. Maker's Mark, for example, even hired a wildlife biologist. You would not have (laughs) thought of that uh, for a spirits company. I think everybody inside Maker's Mark knows this guy. Like, yeah, that's, right. you know, that's Elena. She's obviously the, our wildlife biologist. Totally, totally. They send, they send her or him, like, photos from their walks <laughs> around the neighborhood. Like, what is right. that? <laughs> that's a pigeon, but thank you. <laughs> uh, right. So, uh, Scott, talking about this issue, it goes beyond looking at a company's own operation to really engaging those upstream and downstream, Right. Right. So let's talk about first an example of touching people upstream, like before they produce the product. So Mescal Union's founder realized farmers of the agave it used weren't getting a fair cut. So it actually rallied them to form a union. And today Mescal Union guarantees it will purchase product from 20 small scale unionized distillery partners, over 100 workers all told, and share a sustainable portion of income so that the workers and landowners can continue to grow their own end of the business. And then, so if that's upstream, Scott, we also have downstream where several brands are engaging bartenders on how to be more sustainable. Altos Tequila developed the Tahona Society Collective Spirits, a competition focused on encouraging bartenders to become more socially and environmentally conscious. Then you also have Absolute Vodka, who partners with Trash Tiki, sustainable bartending savants, to offer open source resources with low waste recipes and sustainability tips for bartenders. Jay, I got to actually Google that trash tiki because my girlfriend Shannon and I, we like to throw in non-COVID times tiki parties and make tiki drinks for people that are coming and get creative with it. So yeah, I'd love to throw that party and make drinks that are low waste and incorporate these sustainability tips. Listeners, you're invited to the next one. This could be a good thing to put on Instagram, Jay, like the, the, the pictures of the drinks. Okay, so, and this this is a good segue here because We want to talk about how listeners, and us too, Jay, how we can purchase sustainable spirits that are taking action to be more sustainable. And through those actions, we can encourage more sustainable spirits production. So first of all, let's note that unlike some of our episodes, like the one on sustainable aquaculture, there is no comprehensive certification yet for sustainable spirits. However, you can look for certified organic spirits, since that ensures no chemical fertilizers are used in the production of the ingredients in the the product. An LA-based Green Bar Distillery 
offers a whole line of organic spirits and plants a tree for every bottle used. More and more companies are publishing sustainability reports as well and have sustainability websites so you could do a bit of homework before you buy. You can also find a top-notch retailer who knows their products, and the people there can hopefully direct you to a product where they know the company takes sustainability seriously. Jay, do you have such a retailer that you trust? You know, Scott, it's it's funny you say that because we're going to touch on a topic coming up here in a second, and I'm going to pitch my favorite. Okay, fair enough. So, No doubt, Jay, there is a place on all of these spirit company websites to give feedback. If you see your favorite spirit brand doing the right thing, you know, give them kudos. If you think they taste pretty good, but they're not doing enough on sustainability, let them know they need to improve for you to stay a loyal customer. Nothing drives businesses to act more than hearing from their customers. And of course, you can buy local. Look for distillers in your area and look for spirits made with local ingredients. That cuts down on the emissions from distribution. The American Distilling Institute actually has a map of craft distilleries globally, including more than 2,000 in the U.S. And Scott, here's Mm -hmm. my little pitch for my favorite. Uh, I live by a distillery called Bear Creek Distilling here in South Denver, and uh, they make some killer whiskeys. And they're actually on this map, which is pretty cool to see. So listeners- Very cool. Yeah, we're, we're linking to this in our show notes. Definitely give it a shot. There's a ton- in the U.S. So odds are, if you're living in the States, you're, you're probably close by. And then, of course, regarding the use of local ingredients, talking about buying local. Bullet Whiskey owns or leases actually about 800 acres of farmland adjacent to its Shelbyville, Kentucky distillery in an effort to grow local non-GMO corn buying locally. So smart. Whoever, you know, was putting this together to put a bullet example right before this section now, Jay, on the intro to Bullet Whiskey and its sustained body efforts. <laughs> I don't know who, just, who put, did that, but... Just a little appetizer. Let's get into it. So it's clear from the intro, Jay, that there are many ways a spirits brand can improve its sustainability performance. So to make this a bit more tangible, let's talk specifically about Bullet Whiskey. We're going to dive deep in the interview portion of this episode into their sustainability commitments and tactics, but let's give some background here, Jay. Right. So before we get there, we're just going to touch on some quick history. So... Bullet Distilling Company was founded in 1987 by Tom Bullet, a young attorney with a heck of a name mm-hmm. who quit his job to pursue his true passion and revive an old family recipe. Bullet sold 1.42 million cases in 2019. It's known for its high rye content, which gives it a bold, spicy flavor. Okay, so Bullet is one of the fastest growing whiskeys in America, and it attributes that growth to the bartenders and cultural partners who have adopted it as their own. It's a brand that is all about pushing the frontier and culture forward and believes in collaborating with those stirred by the frontier spirit that the brand was founded on. One cool thing they've done in recent years is Bullet has partnered with boundary-pushing cultural creators on awe-inspiring projects and experiences through its Frontier Works platform. Examples from Bullet's Frontier Works include the Neon in a Bottle art collection, and a 3D printed bar. We've got links to all those examples. They're kind of cool visuals to check out for sure. Now jumping into sustainability. Bullet and its parent company Diageo have made significant commitments to sustainability. For one, Bullet built a state-of-the-art facility in Shelbyville, Kentucky that opened in 2017. In this facility, it employs a variety of practices to reduce carbon emissions, enhance water conservation, and manage waste appropriately. There's also a visitor tasting experience at the distillery. The tasting experience and cocktail bar align with the Oceanic standard, a badge and certification for venues that have adopted sustainable operating practices and are committed to eliminating single-use plastics. The cocktails there incorporate organic garnishes from a garden bullet partnered with the University of Kentucky to create. Okay, so that Shelbyville facility sounds like the leading facility. But forthcoming is another facility in Lebanon, Kentucky, that Diageo is building where Bullet will be the first and lead brand distilled. This facility is slated to be fully operational next year, so 2021, and it will be powered by 100% renewable energy, which helps in the effort for this Lebanon facility to be one of the largest carbon-neutral distilleries in North America. We're going to get into this uh, in the the interview for sure. And also all vehicles including forklifts, will be electric and charged by renewable sources. They are also prioritizing local ingredients as much as possible. If all goes to plan, 
this Lebanon distillery will effectively eliminate more than 117,000 metric tons of carbon emissions each year. To put that into perspective, that's the equivalent of taking more than 25,000 cars off the road for an entire year, but just by how they're operating this facility. Pretty cool. Very cool. And more generally, as a signatory to RE100, Diageo aims to source 100% of its electricity from renewable sources by 2030, and has also signed on to the Global Race to Zero campaign, which is a commitment to achieve net zero carbon emissions by 2050. Recently, Diageo was recognized in the Dow Jones World Sustainability Index 2020 for the third consecutive year, ranked among the most prestigious environmental, social, and governance indices globally. This achievement ranks Diageo in the top four beverage companies worldwide on ESG performance. Okay, so it's probably nice to have a parent company like that, but back to Bullet, it's also seeking to make an impact in the community. This year, it announced a partnership with American Forests to plant 1 million trees over the next five years. Among other benefits, these trees will collectively store runoff water equivalent to 114 Olympic-sized swimming pools, and they will store enough carbon over the next 100 years to effectively take 140,000 cars off the road for a year. As part of this tree planting effort, they are prioritizing white oak, which makes sense since bourbon must be aged in charred oak containers to give it its flavor. All right, listeners, congratulations. We've made it through one heck of an introduction, Ooh. all kinds of vivid examples there. We are now very excited to start transitioning into our interview. So first, let's tee up our expert guests. First, we have Sophie Kelly, SVP of Whiskies at Diageo North America, who truly has a title that probably everyone wants. Sophie has an MBA from the University of New South Wales and has a 20 plus year proven track record as a global strategic brand and agency leader in the marketing and advertising business. And then we'll also have Eric Sprague, VP of Forest Restoration at American Forest. I would argue maybe even a cooler title. I don't know. Tough All one. right. Face off coming up. Yeah. Eric has worked at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay, and has been an American force for the past five years. Like me, Eric graduated with a master's degree, actually two master's degrees, uh, from the School of Public and Environmental Affairs at Indiana University Bloomington. Go Hoosiers! With that, Jay, let's go to the interview. All right, listeners, welcome to the interview portion of the Sustainability and Spirits episode. We're here with Sophie Kelly, a Senior Vice President of Whiskies at Diageo, and Eric Sprague, Vice President of Forest Restoration at American Forest. So we're excited to first really dive into the Bullet and American Forest partnership and then talk about all the things Bullet is doing to advance its sustainability performance. But first, I want to start with a pretty easy one, admittedly. Uh, we want to ask Sophie and Eric, each of you, what is your favorite bullet whiskey and how do you enjoy it? <laughs> yeah, thanks, guys. We're really excited to be here too and talk about our partnership. Uh, but yeah, my favorite drink, bullet drink, is Bullet 10-Year-Old, and it is on the rocks. So what about you, Eric? Well, it's great to be here too and nice to talk to you again, Sophie. Yes. Well, I'm currently working through some bullet rye and, oh, right. and need is my, my go-to, <laughs> but the old-fashioned is you can you can never go wrong there. Too true. And Sophie, I say the 10 years, so is it like was aged in a barrel for 10 years? Is that what that means? That's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And Sophie, I got to say, I actually had some of that bullet 10 year last night and it was also fantastic. So I think we see eye to eye there. Good. You're doing your homework. <laughs> <laughs> this is the hardest homework, Eric, I've ever had to do. Yeah. So, And it was past fail. So uh, <laughs> that's easy. So Sophie, we do want to ask you, though, because some of our listeners might be like, okay, 10 year rye. I don't even know what you're talking about. So can you... First, give our listeners some background on what it is whiskey and how it's made. Yeah, for sure. Look, whiskey is a distilled spirit, and it's um, made from grains including barley, corn, rye, and wheat. And there's lots of whiskies all over the world. You know, most popular in Ireland, Scotland, obviously the U.S., uh, Canada, and uh, Japan. And each of the origins of where the whiskey come from make it true to that country and differentiate it um, to that country. There's kind of one standard thing, which is all whiskies must have a minimum alcohol content of around 40%. Mm -hmm. And 
our most famous type of American whiskey is bourbon, and that should be no surprise to anyone listening. And, you know, a couple of things about bourbon. To be a bourbon, you've got to be made of at least 51% corn, Mm-hmm. You've got to be matured in fresh charred oak barrel casks and uh, you need to be produced in the U.S. Um, there's no actual minimum aging requirement to be considered a whiskey, but to be considered a straight whiskey, you've got to have a minimum of aging of around two years. And all bourbons are aged mostly around four years and over. And hmm. if you're under four years, you have to bear an age statement to declare what you've got. I mean, I think the most interesting thing is, you know, while bourbon's produced in the US and made from corn mash, when you go to Scotland, and I've done that quite a bit, having a big Scotch portfolio, yeah. um, it's mostly made from malted grains, uh, in particular single malt scotches. So blended and single malt scotch like Johnny Walker and Lagavulin are made from malted uh, versus bourbon and American whiskies. Uh, so that gives them di- their different flavor profiles that are that are kind of true to uh, where they're from. You know, the process is kind of amazing, right? You have six basic components to it. Well, they're far from basic, but malting, mashing, fermentation, distillation, maturation, and then, of course, the beautiful bottling. It is an awesome process, an incredible experience, and we recommend having all the listeners and you guys come down to the Bullet Distilling uh, Company and check it out, and we will be sure to treat you incredibly well and <laughs> give you a first-class well, first thing. <laughs> we love the invitation, Sophie. I do think we're actually going to touch a little bit on this whole visiting topic coming up in this conversation. Yeah. But before we get there, and, and Sophie, you kind of did this for us, connecting the dots between whiskey and American forest, right? Because some folks might be like, well, you know, how, how are we combining these two? You did that perfectly, right? So without these oak caskets, bourbon whiskey wouldn't really exist as we know it, right? So Eric, which is where you mm-hmm. come perfectly into play, could you give our listeners a quick overview on American forests and your mission as an organization before we discuss the relationship between you guys and bourbon? Yeah, I'd love to. And I'll, I'll be quick here so we can get to that conversation. Uh, so American Forest, we've been around a long time. Uh, our, our mission is to create healthy forests from cities to large landscapes. We're the nation's oldest forest conservation organization. We were founded in 1875. And almost from the very beginning, we were involved in the, the biggest issues facing forests in America. If you know your history, about that time, a large part of the eastern forest was cleared to make for make way for our expanding population. Um, and so American Forest and other folks got together to um, help rebuild the forest of the United States, create the Forest Service and our forestry profession uh, over that those pivotal years there. So American Forest at the heart of uh, the biggest conversations uh, around forests and trying to be a servant leader to work with folks like Bullet, um, to agencies and to other nonprofits and the public to come up with sustainable solutions. So American Forest has been around quite a long time, and the partnership, though, between American Forest and Bullet is quite new. So I'm wondering if you can tell us about how you all came together and exactly what you're doing to address the issue of our time, as you say, to combat climate change. So American Forest has been working um, to restore white oak forests for, for several years now, and we'll get into the reasons why. But as we were doing that, you know, we had intense interest in, in trying to find a company where we could help tell the story. And as a nonprofit, you're constantly looking for these great hooks to, to connect with people um, and connect why uh, forest management and tree planting is important to, to society. Uh, we, we came across Bullet in a couple of different instances. They're an innovative company uh, trying to think of new ways to do business and to, to make this connection. So it was, it was a great partnership off the start from the start um, and excited to keep working with them. Yeah. And I think from our perspective, guys, you know, we're on a journey with sustainability. We're committed to it. Uh, that's really comes from the core of how we operate in our communities, our local communities. And we believe that it's just good business um, mm-hmm. 
to have uh, a sustainable agenda uh, and to play an active role. And I think more importantly, we look to support um, people like American Forest who are pushing the frontier of sustainability. And we like to get really clear about our commitment. So we're teaming up with Eric and American Forest to plant one million trees over the next five years, which we're super excited about. Uh, and so we're also committing to uh, community relief efforts and setting that off in 2021 in Louisville, which is all around kind of a goal of creating tree equity and green spaces in urban areas. So right. it's a long term commitment and we're at the beginning of it, but we're super psyched. So here we are, we're talking million trees, planting them in, in all these different types of areas. And Scott, I think as we're having this conversation, I'm having flashbacks to our urban greening episode, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> as we're talking about planting trees and all the benefits they provide in that episode in, in urban areas specifically. And and Eric, we do know that as Bullet is committed to working toward tree equity and, and creating green space in urban areas, you guys have your community relief program that you're mm-hmm. really pushing forward with on this. So Eric, could you tell us a little bit more about this program? And that's R E L E A F, which we appreciate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a little yeah. bit of both, and in fact, it's a great, great segue. So our, you know, our community relief program focuses on urban forests, and urban forests are critically important for for people who live in cities. Think of the and provide a lot of relief um, from hot summer days, um, providing shade to cool down. Um, they can help filter air pollutants out of the air and, and improve the health of, of urban populations. They can even help by providing shade, reduce energy usage in commercial and residential buildings. So a key part of um, the role, many folks, not, you know, I think people realize as they're driving to work or taking their kids to school, they'll see trees in, in their cities, but they're actually a major component of the overall national forest cover system. You know, we call uh, urban tree canopy, that that area of, a, of an urban area that's covered by canopy and provides all those benefits, right? If you look at a map of cities like Louisville or many other major cities throughout the country, that map of tree cover is also a map of income and race. Um, Absolutely. And so where, where you have high tree canopy, um, you have more, more wealthy people, more income there. And when you don't have tree equity, you have some you know, some communities that are disadvantaged and in many ways um, even more at risk uh, because of those socioeconomic factors to things like air pollution and, and other strains that a lack of tree canopy can provide. So it's just, there's this vast inequity of the way tree canopy is distributed across the United States. And American Forest is working to, one, communicate that um, and identify where those inequities exist, and then partner with folks like Bullet in some of these key areas to, to bring, back, bring back tree canopy in those areas and doing so in ways that can create jobs um, as well. Fantastic. Well, Jay, now I've got flashbacks to our Equity in Cities episode as well. So yeah. I would encourage listeners to check out, like you're saying, the Equity in Cities episode, the Urban Greening episode for more on this. But I do want to transition us now to talking about Bullet and what it's doing at sustainability. And, you know, Sophie, I, I we did go over in the introduction to this episode, the history of Bullet. But mm-hmm. one thing we couldn't at least find online is how sustainability became such a core value for the brand. So my question is, what was the seed for sustainability at Bullet? I had to do it. I'm sorry. That's it. It was great, and I am laughing. Um, but no, I, listen. Unconvinced. <laughs> yeah, you know we're recording this. We can hear you. <laughs> so, um, if you've studied the way Bullet grew up, it really was championed by local communities, mm-hmm. uh, local bartenders, and it always played a massive role in the community. And It's been a priority for us for a couple of reasons. Uh, We had the chance to, you know, build new distilleries in Kentucky and in Shelbyville and our most recent one in Lebanon. And when you have a chance to start uh, and build something that is going to be, you know, a major production site, you know, and you think about what we do and how reliant we are on natural resources like the water uh, from the region and uh, the trees, it's just good business to have the, this at the forefront. Uh, mm-hmm. And so, you know, really the, the, the mark in the sand was when we built uh, the Bullet Distilling Company in Shelbyville where we focused on reducing carbon emissions 
water conservation and waste management during production. Then we went on to the visitor's centre and said, you know, when we layer over an experience, uh, we have to eliminate practices like single-use plastic. We need to source locally and we need, you know, to be very conscious of waste management. And then, of course, our recent distillery that we just announced, which is a new carbon neutral distillery in, in Lebanon. So, you know, and I would say that this is very much at the heart of Bullet, but it's also attributed to our company 2030 performance goals, of which green to glass sustainability is a critical KPI. You know, it's driven right the way through uh, the priorities of our performance. And so, look, I don't think you can get away with being people's favourite or a corporate favourite without doing the right thing. And I think that the one thing that I hold very near and dear is the fact that I think the pride and passion that releasing this carbon neutral distillery has had in the company has just charge people up enormously about what they can do to make an envi- a difference on the environment and that it is possible. So that's a bit more of the belief in the heart part of it, but um, something that kind of makes me get up every day and makes me proud to do what I do. Yeah, so you had to make the case. It wasn't a sure thing. No, no. And getting there, it's first time you've done it, right? But it was fun and it worked. <laughs> and, and Sophie, I'm curious, you know, when we're talking about these impressive initiatives here. Mm -hmm. It it sounds like it was almost this company just revelation. This is the right thing to do. But are you also seeing that demand coming from the consumer side, maybe internally from your employees? Like, you know. Oh, yeah. You know, look, we are all about purpose at Diageo. And, you know, the bullet consumer expects companies to do good. Uh, and we're on the journey to actually not just do good, uh, but to lead the way. You know, if you look at our Lebanon distillery, I mean, maybe I'm not supposed to say this, but I believe it will be one of the biggest carbon neutral distilleries in the business. So what we're trying to do is plant a flag for everybody else to join us and make a bigger difference. I have to imagine that a lot of these actions and maybe somewhat risks in the sense of can you live up to it? Like making a carbon neutral distillery is not easy. So you bring up Diageo and your parent company. Yeah. And I don't know, Jay, maybe I don't know how many people we've interviewed on the show that have a parent company that is that aggressive. So can you tell us like how important is it to have a parent company that is willing to support some of these riskier leading edge activities? And like, how does it influence the way you all think? And, you know, how often are you talking to people at the parent company? Yeah, well, sort of like our CEO, Ivan, is intimately involved in setting our performance objectives, right? And I think it's really important because, you know, it sends a message that it is as much of a priority as business performance, Mm-hmm. Doing business the right way is the way we want to do it. And investors care. They don't just care about the business, the, the PLs, the profit and loss, right? They want to see how your ESG performance is too. Absolutely. And and what you're keep contributing to 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 society. I mean, yeah. if you look at what we've done, we we sort of set our 2020 goals back in, I don't know, 2014 or 2016. And we've already met them, so we've reset 2030 goals, which are even more aggressive uh, in relation to this. So, you know, this stuff costs money. It's hard to change production across the board. And having, you know, that at the heart and spirit of your company values makes no this decision. Yes, yes well exactly. Played, <laughs> <laughs> makes it, makes it uh, puts the conversation at the front end of the business versus being something you're trying to convince people to do. And and Sophie, riffing off that spirit pun, yes. let's let's pivot for a moment here and talk about whiskey production. Okay. So I have two questions for you. Number one, what ingredient or specific process gives whiskey the most flavor? And number two, and I, I think very interestingly, can sustainability considerations, so things like sourcing energy use or water profile, can those things actually change the way the whiskey tastes? 
That's interesting. I don't believe that these processes change the way the whiskey tastes, right? I would say that, you know, using white oak is critical. People's opinions will differ on what gives (laughs) the most flavor. But I think that one of the things that I was fascinated with is the whole barrel process, right? Uh You know, the color that the barrel imparts, the flavors the barrel uh, uh, brings, and also, you know, just a fascinating part of, you know, the liquid that escapes because of the form and structure of the barrel. Uh, So, you know, I would say it is about playing with the natural ingredients. You know, uh-huh. if you taste a single malt versus a bourbon versus a Canadian, it's about uh, if you look at bullet, like dialing up the rye in relation to the corn, uh, but a lot about the barrels and then also the aging, you know. And then, of course, those barrels that have aged uh, bourbons for five to seven years to 10 to 15 to 18, depending on what liquid you're playing with, are then sent off to Scotland and they go on a new life of their own, which I think is pretty awesome. Yeah, I'll just add that a a neat aspect of it is is that you need a new charred oak barrel for to store bourbon in. And there's a lot of science that goes into that charring process. Certain bourbons will do a, a really quick flash char, others will have them a deeper char and all of that that those chemical processes impart different flavors than as they're matured can really develop. So it's the, the wood is a huge part of that overall flavor. Oh, yeah. How many times can you use a barrel to age? You know, let's say you've done your 10 year aging. Can you just put more in there and do another 10 years or it's kind of one and done? No, no. I mean, you can use them. There's a huge recycling part to the barrels. I mean, that's why they send them over to Scotland to start the process again. For bourbon, it's one time. And one thing we're doing with Bullet in this partnership is we talked about carbon in the trees, but you're also storing carbon in those barrels. And to extend to you're extending the lifespan of those barrels for for decades in different products. Um, That is storing a long-term source of carbon that we're trying to quantify and will produce as part of this partnership, which will be be fun to check out and and follow up on. And I always just thought it was interesting that it's really the barrels that give whiskey and bourbon its color. Right? Exactly. That, mm-hmm. that you yeah. can a, you can technically make whiskey in, I think I've seen it done in, you know, steel containers. Yeah. And it's, you know, much closer to a clear liquid. But I just thought it was really mm-hmm. interesting that it's actually the wood that gives whiskey its, its characteristic kind of caramel color, which. Yeah. And, you know, when you pick up a bottle on shelf, um, you should always have a look at the color. Yeah. <laughs> because that is exactly right. It's the aging that actually gives it, you know, the flavor of complexity and and all the goods. All right. So Sophie, as we're talking about whiskey production, Uh my next question is what is the hardest part of that production when we're talking about reducing its impact? And then is there some component of that production that you've seen over the years make the most progress in reducing its impact? Yeah. So I'd say it's the electrode boiler is a huge accomplishment and commitment because Typically, those boilers are fired by fossil fuels mm-hmm. and now powered by renewable energy. So that is a massive deal. And then I would say just effective use of water conservation is mm-hmm. is is critical uh, and really focusing on that and methods to have more effective processes to try and reduce our water use. You know, I mean, one of the special things about bourbon is the Kentucky limestone filtered water, um, which provides yet again a foundation for the bourbon character. I mean, we spent a lot of time talking about the barrels, right? So, you know, it's just critical um, to really work on reduction of water use right the way through. So I'd say they're the two really, really big ones. And most definitely the you know electro boiler was we we just felt was a huge commitment and um a huge accomplishment and remind me that electro boiler at what point in the production process is that active right well i mean they're pretty much active right the way through the the production process right because if you think about if you go back to 
you know, my brief, simplistic explanation of the process, which is malting, mashing, fermentation, uh, distilling, that they're pretty much right the way through that process. Um, And then obviously the maturing is in the barrels, right? So at least 50 to 70% of the production process. So let's start looking ahead now as we think about not just glasses of whiskey that we'll have in the future, but also about your company's sustainability goals, right? So Sophie, what is next for Bullet when it comes to sustainability? And is there anything you can announce here or, or, or say you might want to tackle that you haven't been able to get to yet? Yeah, so the American Forest Partnership is huge. That's uh, the newest thing we've committed to. We are super excited about uh, the adventure we're going to go on with planting all the trees. But I think, you know, we're also really excited about committing to the Relief Community Programs, which is all about, you know, uh, more green urban areas, okay? And you're going to see the start of that in Louisville, but that is not a one-and-done thing. That is something we uh, expect to roll out across the country. And uh, I believe Eric is selecting locations on that now. And then in the next two weeks, you will see uh, Diageo announce uh, its 2030 targets, which, which will be demonstrating a commitment to reducing carbon emissions across the board and moving the company closer to its goal of sourcing 100% of its electricity from renewable sources by 2030. That's awesome. And Eric, we have to kick it to you too. What is next on your frontier at American Forest? Well, one thing we're really excited about is that this commitment that Bullet's making in in our partnership is really filling into this global momentum that's building for this trillion tree movement, recognizing the, the power that conserving, restoring, and growing a trillion new trees by 2030 has got a lot of power uh, to help fight climate change. Uh, it's not the silver bullet, right? There's a lot of other things we have to do, including a lot of the great uh, innovations that Sophie talked about just a few minutes ago. But there's a real role for it. Uh, planting trees is one of the best ways we have to removing more carbon from the atmosphere. And so this partnership fits really nicely into that overall concept that American Forest is really gearing up around. Um, we are the, our, the co-secretariat for the U.S. chapter of 1T.org, an initiative bringing companies, uh, agencies, universities, and other partners together to to try to meet that goal. Mm -hmm. So Sophie, we got a uh, website from Eric. Where should people go to learn more about Bullet and its sustainability endeavors? Yeah, bullet.com and all our social channels talk about what we're doing. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. So Sophie, Eric, we have our typical or famous Last question for you as we wrap up every episode and every interview we do, and that is our party fat question. So let's say we're at the brand new Lebanon distillery. We've got our samples of bullet whiskey that taste, even if sustainability doesn't directly impact a flavor, we know it tastes that much better because it's made with renewable energy and all these other considerations that are going into it. But we're sharing these drinks and we want to uncover one fact that we can share with our friends or maybe podcast listeners in this sense that will stick with them when it comes to sustainability and whiskey or Eric for you with sustainability and white Oak when it comes to whiskey. Mm -hmm. So I ask you both, what would that one fact, that one nugget be that we could share with others as our party fact? So I think one of the coolest things about the white Oak tree is that it can produce up to 7,000 acorns per year. Uh, It's really important for black bear, wild turkey, and other animals. It's part of what makes it the most ecologically important tree in the eastern United States. Mm, So it's not just whiskey and bourbon. No. That's right. That's amazing. (laughs) Okay. So I guess my turn, right? Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm normally really good at superficial party tricks, but I'm being really, (laughs) this is a very serious topic. Okay. So one fun party fact is one uh, white oak tree yields about two barrels of bourbon and one barrel is about 150 bottles. So just imagine... Uh, when you're enjoying a glass of bourbon, um, who you can thank, which is that white oak tree. <laughs> That's right. That's fantastic. I love that. So, all right. I think that with the party facts done, I think we're good to go. I want to <laughs> thank uh, Sophie and Eric for joining us and sharing 
what they're doing at Bullet and what they're doing together to plant more white oak trees. So thanks. Thanks to you both. Yes. Thank you. It was a lot of fun. Congrats. Appreciate it. I uh, appreciate that. And and thanks to you and, and Eric for what you all are doing. And we look forward to keeping up with it and inform our listeners of developments. So, so thanks again. All right. Take care, guys. All right. Take care of yourself. And definers, as we wrap up this episode, we do want to provide just a little bit more information on Diageo's 2030 targets that Sophie just teased. They are calling this initiative Society 2030 Spirit of Progress, a great little play on words there. But a couple of cool ones that we like, number one, achieve net zero carbon emissions across their direct operations. Number two, reduce carbon emissions by 50% in their supply chain. Number three, use 30% less water in every drink they make. And I thought this was pretty cool. By 2026, replenish more water than they use in water stressed areas. And finally, and critically, increase representation of leaders from ethnically diverse backgrounds to 45%. To learn more, just search Diageo 2030 targets and there you are. All right, Scott, if I had to distill this entire episode into one word, (laughs) I think it would be Uh the same word I used to describe the type of whiskey I like, and that is neat. Ooh, nice. (laughs) Thank you. Thank Have you. you always liked it neat? Uh, you know, I think I kind of did. Because I think, Scott, my issue is when I have ice in it, I'm just too rushed to drink it because I'm like, oh, the ice is going to water oh, down the flavor. You're such a purist. Oh, my God. And so I kind of just like, yeah, went for it neat and grew some hair on my chest. And, <laughs> and it's kind of been that way ever since. All right. So as we wrap this up, we want to thank some folks that, that keep this whole thing going. Number one is Keaton Butler, and and we were, Scott, you and I just talking before this episode about how just amazing she's already been. Oh. We're so grateful to have her on as our audio editor. Yes. Uh, it has just been fantastic. We also want to thank Matt Ahrens, who is just maintaining such a strong presence anywhere you see us, truly, whether that's social or on our website. Thank you, Matt. And we'd also like to thank the musicians we've been citing really since episode one, that is square peg around hole and potions for the music we use in our episodes. And then a request from us to you is to rate review and subscribe to our podcast on Apple podcasts or wherever you get your podcast. We do monitor the Apple podcast reviews and that's because we read one at the end of every episode in the hopes that uh, that'll motivate some of you to, to maybe leave a review. We do have a recent one from October 22nd, 2020 it is from Corgis, Rorts, <laughs> Arthur, and then Codals, the Codals part in all caps. Uh, okay. Uh, it's titled Great Podcast, exclamation mark. And the review is, love this podcast. So informative and, and entertaining. I love how Jay and Scott incorporate humor and education all in one podcast. Corgis, Rorts, Arthur, Codals. You shouldn't have. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, you, you've distilled our our podcast is perfectly incorporate humor and education, right? Jay truly a, a handle that's going to go up there with some of the best we've ever seen. Corgi's roar to Ardle coddles. Mm-hmm. All right. So quick reminder, folks, this is our December episode when we typically do our holiday hodgepodge, the hodgepodge came in early to give you maybe a little bit of extra time to get your sustainable holiday gifts. So check that out. We released that in November and it is there for your listening pleasure And I think, Scott, with that, that about does it for 2020. So, listeners, congratulations. You've made it through 2020. Thanks for joining us through this unforgettable and and great and maybe not so great ways. Uh, But we can't wait to see you in 2021. We will see you on the other side. And I think, Jay, that about does it. You all stay sustainable out there. I'm Scott Breen. And I'm Jay Siegel. We will see you next year.